Well, it's rather a chilly Durban <laughs> that I am greeting you from tonight, but it's just wonderful to be seeing you, especially after we've all had a little break. But I'm um, looking forward to connecting with you tonight. And it's the seventh session. Can you believe that? Time really has gone so quickly. So just waiting for folks to join us. And then we'll pray and we'll start um, tonight's session. Yo, it's been an amazing time of preparation. With the cold weather, I've been battling a little bit with hay fever. So I've been praying and just taking authority. But um, all is good and all is well. Just waiting to see if anyone's found me tonight. But, um, oh, there you go. Lovely to see Debs and Carmen. Lovely to see you guys. We're going to be doing the letter to the Philadelphian church tonight. And um, so for those of you that want to get ready, that's the page that we're going to be connecting with. Oh, there, Renetta's on. Lovely. Hope you had a wonderful birthday, cuz. And Lisa's on. And I believe it was Anne Ward's birthday. We missed her birthday. Sorry about that, Anne. <coughs> okay, let's see. I think we've got a few more minutes to go. There we go. Well, I'm going to start in prayer, and then we will discuss um, the church, the, the letter to the Philadelphian church tonight. Father God, I just want to thank you once again for this incredible privilege that we have to be able to share just something of your word and to unpack something of your, your message to the church. And we know, Jesus, that everything about these letters have been the heart of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father specifically to the end time church so i really pray continuously for revelation i pray for continuous just information and knowledge and for the seven spirits before the throne to be brooding here tonight and for people to understand and grasp and get some bigger picture of what you've been saying and lord once again what comes from me and has no relevance let that not in any way take a hold but what comes from your heart and from your spirit, let it not be forgotten. I thank you for that. I thank you for your anointing. And I thank you for your absolute gift of the teaching the word of God so that people can grow. Bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Bless you guys. Well, it's the seventh letter. It's the sixth letter to the seven churches. And it's at the Church of Philadelphia. And um, and this was the period of time from the 17 to the 1900 years. So it was 200 years. And I want to once again just show you the little pictures because they just help. I'm a, I'm a visual person, so I always understand things better when I can visualize it. So I just want to give you a bit of vis visualization here. And for those of you that have got this, this graft, we look at this graft and we see that the Church of Ephesus, first letter, some of them fell away. They were Nicolaitans, and they had got pagan beliefs and, and the, the Jewish beliefs that was added to their structure, the compromise. And so we saw the falling away with some of the, the compromise in Nicolaitans. But those that stayed committed and pure went on to be the Smyrna Church. And we see the Smyrna Church was addressed about the, um, the synagogue of Satan, which was the synagogue... The church, those that are meant to be following God, but they weren't following God, and they were following their own ways. They were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all those that were caught up, and those that were involved with Kabbalism, and he called them the synagogue of Satan, that were coming against the real church. Now, we see out of that, the Smyrna church, the pure church, excuse me if I sneeze tonight, but I am battling a bit with hay fever. We see that out of that, the Pergamus church was separated, which was a continuation of the compromising church and the beginning of the state church under Constantine 300 years after Jesus left. That became the Tyre church, which was the full-blown Roman Catholic church and the Greek Orthodox, Orthodox church, which was the state church that was controlled and became so paganistic just embracing everything that was paganism into the church and making it giving it religious reasons to be worshipped until there was very little left of that which jesus left behind so that was the church of tartara 
then last the last session we spoke about the church of sardis and that was the the remnant the reformers that were separated out of that church those bold people some of them gave their life some of them died for their cause but they brought the word back they brought baptism back they brought worship back and they started bringing back that which jesus had originally established as part of the church now some of those from the tyatara church carried on in the state church and they the state church just carried right on and continued going those that were part of the paganism and those that were part of the Kabbalism and all the Jewish cultures, they just kept going. And then we see here with the Sardis church, some of the reforming churches just kept going. And they just continued exactly like they were established by all those different reformers that we learned about last time. But the next church is the Philadelphia church. And this is the church out of the reformer church that embraced the next season of what jesus wanted to give back into the church and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight the reformer church now if i look at this diagram we see that the first church was 100 years the next church season was 200 years the next pergamos church era was 300 years it was in the first church era that jesus left um, then we see the Tyatara church, which was the longest church era of 900 years, the state church controlling everybody for 900 years, but there was always a remnant that held on to the truth. Remember, the remnant, the spirit-filled remnant never ever ceased to be. Many of them were burnt at stakes as witches and all kinds of things happened in the process, but there was always the remnant. There was always the church that held on to that which was true. Then we see the Sardis church, the remnant church, which was 200 years. And tonight we're going to be looking at the Philadelphia church, which was also a period of 200 years. Here at the Sardis church was the first time that anything was spoken about Jesus coming back. And he said to that church, the reformer church, the ones that had not embraced the Holy Spirit, I'm going to come back like a thief in the night and you will not be ready for me. But to the next church, we'll see what he says tonight. So that's where we are now. And then um, the letter to the church is from Revelation 3, verse 7 to 13. Okay. Now, this was the, the sixth letter to the church of Philadelphia. And Philadelphia means the favored church, but the name means brotherly love. The city of Philadelphia was not as old as the others. And for, for many of them, it was quite a modern city in Asia Minor. It was founded in about 189 BC. So just a short little while before Jesus came. And it was on the highway which led to the interior. Its name was given to it in honor of Attalus II. And because of his loyalty to his older brother, Euphemes II, who was the king of Lydia. And that's where the name Philadelphia comes from which means brotherly love, the love of the younger brother toward his older brother. Another name that the city was given was Decapolis. Now remember within in, um, Luke, in Mark 5, verse 18 to 20, it talks about Jesus arriving at, the, at De Decapolis, um, and that's where the man that was so demonized was, and he told that man um he cast out all those demons and they went into the pig and all that and then he told the man to go back to decapolis and tell them what had happened now decapolis means a city one of ten cities and so even though they had the same name it wasn't in the same area the one was in um in turkey and the other one was in the area of canaan and where jesus was ministering and so um the same name same ten groups of cities but a different region so it was like the one where jesus cast out the demons but it wasn't the same grouping of cities the notes there say it was but actually it wasn't um so i just want to fix that it was two different areas and um but it was named the same name because it was one of a group of 10 cities but they changed the name from decapolis to philadelphia which means brotherly love Okay, now we're going to talk quite a bit about the era of Philadelphia and the scripture of Philadelphia. So let's have a look at what Jesus said about this church. In Revelation 3, verse 7 to 13, it said to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write, 
These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. I mean, how amazing is that, the way he presents himself? After he's presented himself so harshly to some of them with a blazing eyes and with a two-edged sword, and here he says, I'm the one that's holy and true, and I hold the keys of David. What he opens, no man can shut, and what he shuts, no man can open. I know your, uh, um, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no man can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my holy name. I will make those who are of the, the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. How amazing is this word to the Philadelphia church? Since you've kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole earth to test those who live on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold on to the, what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from, from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So now we see the letter to the Philadelphia church and there is no threat. It's just the most loving, beautiful letter. And it just tells us that Jesus is well pleased with the church in Philadelphia. What was this church era? It was the era of great obedience to the Great Commission of Matthew 28. And I just want to read that Great Commission because it's the first time in the history of the church since the church was established in, in Ephesus that we see the Great Commission being established. Remember Ephesus and then they were scattered and they went all over the place and that led to the to the great persecution and, the, and all the martyrs and the gospel was spread all over the world because they were scattered. And this is the next time that they went into the full evangelism that was commissioned in Matthew 28. Matthew 28, um, 18 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely... I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so they picked up on that commission. And it's the first time that we see the commission being fully um, completed by the will of man, not by the scattering of God. Okay, now the first thing we need to know is that um, one of the quotes that came out of that season was this. You can never have authority over that that you do not love. And so God gave them the most incredible love for evangelism and for reaching the lost. And their obedience came at a great commission. They literally gave their lives. We see that the Smyrna church physically gave their lives. They, they shed their blood for the sake of the church. In the Philadelphia church, they gave their lives. They gave their destiny so that the gospel could be preached. Um, their obedience was to, to establish the Great Commission. All of them gave their destiny to reach people out of a great love for God. So we see the love of the Father being so birthed again and being so established in the hearts of men. Um, they, they discovered their calling, their anointing and their appointment by fulfilling their destiny and for going into the fullness of what God had called them to be. They, their calling only came once they moved into destiny. And that is so important. So many people are always wanting to know, what is my calling? What is my calling? What is my calling? Out of being obedient to the commission, they discovered their calling. They just went. And as they went, they discovered what it was that God had anointed them to do. It was not out of function, but out of an overflow of loving people God's way. 
They understood destiny and they understood how to move in their calling. They hungered after the Holy Spirit. They were completely motivated by love, every single one of them. Worship was completely restored back into the church for all believers. The Bible was printed in the languages of people wherever they went. They reached people. They changed cultures. Um, they started teaching about Jesus' second coming. So it was only after the 1700s that people started talking about the second coming of Jesus again. Before that, it was never spoken about. Now they started preparing people and telling them he's coming back, he's coming back. Because his letter said, I am coming soon. And they started talking and preparing people for the second coming of Jesus. It was known as the missionary era, era where people lay down their lives for the sake of the gospel. Jesus had opened great doors for them and there was a great commission to go. They hungered after more. They were completely motivated by their love for God um, and they couldn't wait to fulfill their, their calling and gave up everything for the sake of the calling of God. What was Jesus' attitude to these people? These are the words of him who is holy and true. He, he, he represented himself to them as holy and true. And that was the way they received him, as holy and true. And he said, I hold the keys. Isaiah 22, 22 says that the keys of David were given to him. That, that whatever he opens, no man can shut. And what he shuts, no man can open. And he said to them, I have opened a great door for you. And so he literally swung wide the gates and opened the door for them to go out and to go and reach the lost and to save the world and to commission them to go and reach the unreached people that had never been reached before. So we're going to talk about a few of these tonight. Remember the big difference between what had been established through the reformers and what was established through um, through the missionaries was the fact that they were now operating under the power of the Holy Spirit, which the reformers had not done. The first one to do that had been um, George Fox from the Quaker movement, and that was just at the beginning, at the end of the reformer and at the beginning of the Philadelphia era. So he was the first one um, that stepped into that. But out of that were birthed the most amazing people. So I'm going to start talking tonight, and the first ones that we're going to talk about is John and Charles Wesley. Now, they were brothers, and um, I get so emotional when I talk about the lives of these people because they gave up everything so that the kingdom of God can be established. And I, and I must say, for me, I have read the stories of so many of the missionaries, and, and that's always been something that's been on my heart, you know, that, that I want to know one day that, that my life made a difference because people's lives were changed being motivated by these amazing people. And now when I tell you about Charles and John Wesley, um, their period of lifestyle, John was from 1703 to 1791, and Charles was slightly younger, 1707 to 1788. Charles actually died before John, but um, he was born after John. So their mother, her name was Susanna, and she was the daughter of a Puritan, and she married Samuel Wesley, who was an Anglican minister. Now, um, somebody asked me at the end of last week, where, would they, where did the Puritans fit in? Well, the Puritans were reformers that moved people out of the Anglican church because, remember I told you, the Anglican church was not established as a reformer church, but out of rebellion. And so there were a whole lot of people that that's worked out of the Anglican church um, to try and bring the truth of the word back and one of those were the Puritans, and they were called Puritans because they were the pure gospel and holiness, and that was their movement. And so uh, Susanna's father was a Puritan preacher, and she married uh, Samuel Wesley, who was an Anglican uh, a, a preacher clergyman, and he was always traveling. He was always all over the place. So she was the one that was the homeschooler, the spiritual leader, the mother, and ran the home for her 19 children. Most of them died, and um, she was she was left with three boys and seven girls. Most of them died in infancy, but she had three boys and seven girls, um, of which eight were still alive when she actually died. She was an amazing woman. She used it was said that she used to put her apron over her head, 
And that was when she would have a quiet time and her children knew that when mom's apron was over their head, then, then they left her alone to have a quiet time with Jesus. She was radical. She was awakened. She was spiritful. She was just the most remarkable woman. She, um, John himself nearly died in a fire and was saved out of a burning building. So he nearly lost his life, but he was saved and he became known as John Wesley. Her, her primary source was their education and their spiritual growth. It was said that she started homeschooling them at five. And what she would do is she would teach them the complete alphabet in the first day. All of them, but for two, grasped it in the first day. And she said that the two they didn't were remarkably slow because they didn't grasp at the age of five the whole alphabet in one day. But not only did she give them a good education, they went on to study Greek and Latin. They were all highly educated. And it was very important to her that her children studied in education and that they studied theology her husband spent quite a long time of his life in london where he was working in london and so what she did was she started an afternoon um worship time with her children where they would sing and worship together and then she would read them either one of her husband's sermons or one of her father's sermons well they, these were such powerful times and they were so spiritual these times because she was a spiritual woman that local people started joining. And eventually there were over 200 local people that were coming to her Sunday afternoon services, so much so that the church in the morning had to shut because people weren't supporting that anymore. Her greatest delight was when her sons discovered their awakening, what she called when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, she had her daily devotions that she ran with her children. And one of the things that was amazing about her was she felt it was absolutely it's essential that she got to know every one of their ch her children for who they were uniquely and who were who they were created to do who to be and so every night she spent different time with one child every night so that she could spend quality time with her children so they used to rotate and she would spend with all of those four um, seven girls and three boys that lived she would spend an evening with each one of them and then go back and spent so every one of them had quality time with her they got to know her intimately she got to know them intimately and she could build into the character of who they were john and charles um ministered together they founded what was called the holy club which then became known as the methodists because of the methodical way that they worked out the the scriptures and the commands they followed the teachings of um the dutch reformer jacobus um, Arminium which was known as the Arminium doctrine rather than the Calvinistic doctrine because they did not agree with Calvinist um, teachings that people were predestined. And remember last week I said to you, it seemed to be that they said some people were predestined to be saved and some people weren't. And if you were predestined to be saved and you met Christ, then there was no way that your salvation would ever be questioned and you were you were once saved, always saved. And they didn't agree with this and nor did uh, Jacobus Arminium. And what they agreed, uh, believed was that, um, and he was a reformer between 1560 and 1609. Salvation and condemnation was decided on the day of judgment. This is what they believed. Um, and that it was conditioned by grace that enabled for faith or unbelief, that atonement was available to anybody who wanted it, but it was through the belief in Christ Jesus um, that no man can respond to God's will, but for the power of the Holy Spirit to lead him to that, that man can resist the grace of God and that believers can resist sin and they can live through the grace of God and live holy lives. So they believed in grace. They believed that it was a choice. They believed you could resist it and you can receive it. And they believed that the fullness of the salvation was not decided on the day that you accepted Christ, but on judgment day depending on the way that you had lived your life. Um, they both preached and they both wrote incredible hymns. Um, and their main objection was to bring salvation to England. They did not set out to start or to plant churches. But the Wesleyan movement and the Methodist movement came out from what they had established. John was known mostly for his sermons, even though he wrote many hymns. And Charles was no, known mostly for his hymns, even though he preached many Gospels. And it was the sermons of John 
that was said to have stopped the revolution of England at the time when the French Revolution was happening in France. And so their influence over England and Ireland was very, very powerful. John started small groups all over the place, and they were accountability groups where people held each other accountable, discipling groups where they discipled each other. There was religious instruction in the groups, and that he then um, appointed unordained evangelists, which was amazing because in the reformers you had to be ordained, you had to be chosen, but here he chose people according to their gifting, and they were unordained um, evangelists to preach, to travel just like he did, and to care for these small groups. So it was really quite revolutionary the way that they started the group. So what they established was a people being evangelized and looking after each other. The priesthood of all believers was being given back its rightful place. The spirit was moving mightily, and there was incredible things happening through the lives of John and uh, Charles Wesley. And they were traveling all over Europe and Ireland, England and Ireland, establishing the things of God. Under Charles's leadership, people became leaders in many, many different spheres, and they were got very involved with social issues and the prison reform and the and the abolishment of slavery in England um, happened because of the way that he taught people to be leaders in the community and everything they did to represent Christ wherever they were. Amazing man, amazing doctrine, and amazing what they established. Wesley taught the gospel, um, aiming for Christian perfectionism through the love of God and for the supreme heart of holiness. His focus was the love of the Father and holiness. He spoke strongly against Calvinism and predestination and once saved, always saved. And he spoke strongly about the fact of grace being the power of sanctification and transformation for any believer. He encouraged personal experiences with Jesus and they taught people how to have personal experiences with Jesus. And he was known as the most loved man in all of England. So Susanna Wesley did a great thing with her children. And she left behind, the, she was known as the mother of Methodism, and she established these mighty men that changed a nation because of her commitment. And I want to say to anybody that battled in their season of mothering, she was just a mother with a vision. And all she ever did was establish her children well in the things of God. But the overflow of that was so many other people's lives were affected because of her. And those two mighty men rose up and is still spoken about today. And the movements that they birthed weren't birthed because they wanted to birth them, but was birthed by the example that they left behind. Amazing men of God. The next one that I want to talk about is William Carey. And he was 1761 to 1834, and he was a man that I personally really admired because of his um, incredible determination and because of his incredible uh, passion for the love of God and also because of his love of India. And um, for, for me personally, that's a, another love of my life has been the East and India being a huge part to play in that. So I've really uh, treasured reading up about William Carey, 1761 to 1884. Um, he said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. He was a shoemaker that was a Baptist missionary from the Baptist Missionary Society, and he was sent to India. His wife didn't really want to go, and they had a, a son. And um, because she didn't really want to go, she never, ever had a heart for the mission or for India. When they got to India, the, the lawyer that had arranged the trip for them uh, disappeared with their passports. And so suddenly they were in the country illegally and they had to live as convicts. They had to hide. They had no money. They were poverty stricken. And for, I think it was a period of seven years, he worked incredibly hard to reach the lost and to save, uh, bring salvation to a people and he never, ever got one single salvation. In the meantime, his son got dysentery and died. His wife had a nervous breakdown. She absolutely hated him. And apparently, the story goes, she tried to kill him on a few occasions. And eventually, she died of bitterness and misery um, in India, absolutely hating what he was involved with. 
After a period of time, and I think it was about seven years, the Baptist uh, Society sent a helper to come to him. And the man arrived, said, I've come to help you with your mission. And he was so discouraged and so disillusioned. He said, well, there is no mission. I have one one person and it was the, the person that was helping him in the work that had got saved. And he said to the guy, you better go back because there's nothing here for you. What do you do? And the man said, I'm a printer. And so something stood in his heart to start translating the Bible for people to be able to read. And that's how his ministry began. He was never called there to be an evangelist. But the moment he found his calling out of his destiny, God absolutely anointed him with favor. And so he started a printing press. He, he eventually um, uh, translated the Bible into 40 different Indian languages. He started a newspaper. It was the first time there was an Oriental newspaper called the Friends of India because he felt that like people needed to have social reform and they needed to have a mouthpiece and they needed to know what was going on. So he started the India. He introduced um, the, the, the newspaper in India. He introduced a banking system for saving and so then he started affecting the banks. In the meantime, he was getting converts. In the meantime, God was sending people to him. One of them was a woman, a rich widow that believed in his work, that came to help him with finances, eventually married her, and together they established many, many schools for all children in India. Now, young girls had never been allowed to study, and nor had the lower costs ever been allowed to study and he started schools for all the children in India and started educating the children and universities were established by him and some of the things that he stood for was was um, even changed in the government and in, in the governmental level so they got to know him in governmental levels and so his life not only brought the gospel to India, but affected the very culture of India, the agriculture of India, the news, the, the education of India, the fact that the Bible was made available to the Indians. And he served and loved that country with all of his heart. Um, because of the Hindu belief of Maya, M-A-Y-A, they believe that nature or creation is an illusion to be shunned. And so because of that, there was no agriculture. Nothing was developed. There was the, the country was incredibly fertile, but it was under jungle. It was covered with many, many serpents and snakes and beasts. And he just looked at this and he thought, no, he needed to introduce something that was a system of linear planting and organization. So he published the first science textbooks so that they could learn and study about agriculture and nature and he could start farming, they could start farming, and they could start using the land to the fullness of its ability. He came against the Hindu culture in many of the things that he stood for. Because of reincarnation, they had laws of um, violent death for lepers, which would give them a better chance of having a purified body and reincarnation. And so one of the things that he started was he campaigned against the inhumane treatment of the lepers, because they were very often buried alive or burnt so that they could have these violent deaths so that they had a better chance in reincarnation. So he stood and helped to be able to bring a, a, a more humane way of treatment in for the lepers and the leper colonies and fought for the people that were not only shunned but brutally murdered as well because of their belief system. And so he stood and um, changed so much of that system of belief um, that applied to the lepers, that applied to the agriculture, and then specifically for the women. Women were treated terribly badly. They were owned, there was polygamy, they were treated badly under polygamy, there was child marriages, um, there were many of the women that were killed in what they called kitchen accidents, where these young women were married, and if the mother-in-law didn't like them, they just killed them. And the next thing that was very, very strong at the time that he was there was what was called Sati. And Sati was when a young widow and these girls were married as children brides. And then these old men, these rich old men would die. And because of reincarnation, the, the, the wife had to die with the husband. So they were put onto the pile um, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the cremation of the husband. And they were put on and cremated with him alive. And, um, and he really hated this and he fought for 25 years and eventually got Sati outlawed in India and made it an illegal practice that they no longer were allowed to to be to ill treat these young women in this way 
He then took on a whole lot of these widows. He helped find them husbands. He, he, he helped them to become literate and he educated them. And he stopped so much of the ill treatment that had happened against women. And he had major breakthrough because he started educating young Indian girls. So William Carey's life in India changed a nation. And the, the effect of one man that was sold out to go and love the Indian people because of a God of love changed the ethos of a nation. And his name is still known. And so much of what he has established is still seen and still known in India today. An amazing man with an amazing story. And I just love reading about um, William Carey and, and what God did through his life. Now, the next one was... Um, the first woman a missionary, and her name was Anna, and she was desperate to be used of God as a missionary. So she married Ad Ad Adonirama, Adoni Rama Judson, and they got married on the 5th of February in um, 1892, and the very next day, they left from Salem in America to go to Calcutta to go and become missionaries. And the reason she married him was that she could become a missionary um, with this man who was in ministry. So they, they left for Calcutta, but they were ordered to leave Calcutta because Calcutta didn't want any more uh, missionaries to work there. So they went from Calcutta to Burma, which is Myanmar today. And so once again, another nation. That just burns in my heart because I love Myanmar so much. I've been there so many times and I just love the people and I love going there. But this couple did an amazing thing in Burma. The Burmese people had never, ever heard the gospel. These were the first to take the gospel to Burma. Anne prayed when she got there and she saw the 15 million people in such deep darkness with the Buddhism that they were worshipping. And she prayed that the light of the world would disperse the thick darkness over the 15 million people. She prayed that arise and shine, light of heaven, Isaiah 60, displace your grace and power among, um, display your grace and power among the Burmese people. Make them your chosen people. What an amazing prayer. So they landed in Burma, Burma and they translated the scriptures. You know, as I said to you before, once they followed the destiny and they followed the commission, they discovered their gifting once they were there because what they were good at just automatically started overflowing. And started teaching the woman to pray and to read the scriptures. Once again, she took an, Ill an illiterate woman. And you know, in so much of the East, as in so much of the world, the women were the property of men. They were used, abused, and sold. And no, no importance was put on women to be educated. They were illiterate. And they just were there to be used for whatever men felt that they needed to be used for. And so Anne started teaching the woman to pray, to read scripture. She helped them to learn to read. Um, in 1822, she got desperately sick from a liver disease. And she went home. And in the time, which was in America, and in the time that she was there, she wrote the history of the Burmese missions to encourage other women missionaries to go out there and to go and work among these women in Burma. In 1822, 23 she returned to Rangoon which is today called Yangon and war broke out very soon after that between the British and the Burmese and because they were American and they were white skinned they were considered to be the friends of Britain and so her husband was thrown into prison um, for to die in prison and she was basically put under house arrest as a young woman and a pregnant mommy. And she then went and found herself a place to live very close to the prison where she would go and feed her husband and feed the other prisoners and provide for them and care for them and look after them in the season that they were in prison because nobody was looking after them. She eventually got desperately sick with smallpox and spotted fever. He was eventually released from prison in 1826, which they didn't think was going to happen. Um, but she was so weak and so sick that she died from, from the fever, and six months later, her little girl died as well. And so he was left in Burma without his wife and without his child. But he didn't stop the work that they'd gone there to do. He continued the work. 
Anne was the first woman missionary to leave America. Her constant love for God and her constant encouragement to other women to go stirred up in the hearts of other women that eventually then left and became missionaries in the East as well. Um, Adinaram stayed and he completed the entire Bible in the next 24 years. In 1850, he died, having established 63 churches and 163 missionaries with a whole lot of native church leaders as well. The gospel had been brought to Burma and he left behind a legacy of having taken the gospel to a people. And when Burma shut down and there was this long period of time where no one could enter in and no one could do anything or reach Burma, the work that they had established continued among the Burmese people. And his Bible is still used today as a Bible that's been made available to the Burmese people. What an amazing couple. They gave their life. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the next amazing missionary that's opened door. <coughs> Excuse me. Swung wide, that Jesus swung wide so that the nations could get to know him. The next one was Hudson Taylor. He lived in 1832 to 1905. And he was a man that went to China. What was amazing about Hudson Taylor, excuse me. <coughs> His parents were God-fearing people. Excuse me a minute, okay. His parents were God-fearing people and they prayed. They said, God, give us a son so that he could be a missionary to China. How amazing is that? They not only prayed for a son, but they prayed for his destiny as well. And um, he studied medicine and theology. And in 1854, he went to China. He worked there for six years. And then he returned and he translated the New Testament into the Ningpo dialect. He also prayed for more missionaries and he formed the China Inland Mission in 1865. So he went back to England <coughs> and he went to go and recruit other missionaries to come and help him. Excuse me. <coughs> So he started the China Inland Mission in 1865 and that recruited and trained a whole lot of missionaries to be able to go and work in China. He eventually went back to China and he worked there for another 40 years. At his death, he had established 205 mission stations, 849 missionaries and 125,000 Christian converts chinese christian converts it was the work of hudson taylor that was so instrumental in what went on to become the underground church that kept china alive in all the years of communism he he started such an amazing work and got so many chinese converts they said that because it was culture the chinese culture was important to him and he wanted to be accepted by the Chinese people. He grew his hair long, he darkened it, and he dressed to look like a Chinese man so that he could be accepted, not only to reach them with the gospel, but to say that he honored them and he loved their culture and he wanted them to know that he loved them that much. And so he presented himself and he looked like, he dressed like, exactly the way that the Chinese dressed and looked in those days. An amazing man. Um, uh, just China wouldn't be serving God today if it wasn't for Hudson Taylor. Burma wouldn't know what they know today for the gospel if it hadn't been for Anne Judson and her husband. And we see the same with William Carey in India. 
The work that these people did changed nations and their lives counted and they gave their lives so that nations could be saved. God said, ask of me and I will give you the nations. And they asked and they were given nations. The next one I want to talk about is Charles Spurgeon. 1834 to 1892 he was a baptist preacher and he's known as the prince of preachers at the age of 20 he had his first church at the age of 22 he had his first mega church 5,000 people seated and a thousand standing he followed the calvinistic theology and he was very dramatic in his teaching. He always gave stories and told testimonies. He loved telling stories about dying children that got saved and, and about parents and about poor parents and about the, the repenting harlots. And he was very dramatic in the way that he did it. And his gospel offended many people. He had a strong gospel. It was an eternal burn type gospel. And because of his strong gospel, many were offended by him. But he preached again what he called the downgrading of the faith. What we today would call seeker sensitive. He hated it and he stood against it and he preached against it. And he was known as the prince of preachers. One of his quotes was this. Anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It only empties today of its strength. He established orphanages and almshouses. He established the pastor's college. He supported Hudson Taylor in China. And he supported the ministry of D.L. Moody. And so this was an amazing man. And his ministry was in England. And he was converting people in England. And the next one I want to talk about is D.L. Moody. So these, you know, it's just so incredible how God opens the portal and then it was the portal of evangelism. It was the portal of brotherly love. It was the portal of people that love God so much that they were prepared to give themselves completely so that other people could get saved wherever they went. And they gave their lives to those nations. And the next one was D.L. Moody. And he was the one that was supported by Spurgeon. He was in 1837 to 1899. He was an American evangelist and a publisher and he was connected with the holiness movement and it was um dr moody that that um that and i forget the name of the guy now the american that was living in san francisco whose wife and children went ahead of him the lawyer to go and help dr moody when they when their ship sank and they drowned and when he came over the place where they drowned later on where when he sorted out all the business in in um Chicago, I think it was in Chicago. And when he when he went over the place where his family had drowned on his way to go and help DL Moody, he's he wrote that song, It Is Well with My Soul. Um and so an amazing man with an amazing testimony. And he left his family left America to go and help DL Moody, but he ended up being the only one that got there to help. So D.L. Moody was an American evangelist and a publisher. He was connected to the holiness movement. He founded the Moody Church. He also founded the Northfield School and the Mount Hermon School in America. He started the Moody Bible Institution that we still know about today, Moody Publishers. And he went to England in 1872 and he filled the stadiums in England with 15 to 30,000 people. He was known as the greatest evangelist of the 19th century <clears throat> he said only work that the only work that is going to stand to eternity is the work done by the holy spirit and not by one of us an amazing man absolutely sold out for god absolutely filled with the spirit and absolutely recognizing that he would not take glory for what was done it had to go the glory had to go to the holy spirit an amazing man from America, worked in America, but also had a great effect on England and worked with Spurgeon in England and Spurgeon supported his ministry and his evangelism. So that was D.R. Moody and we see how so many of them got involved with publishing the gospel, making it available in the different languages. We see um, the, lang the, the, the gospel got to India, got to China, got to Burma. Um, and through Moody got to, to England and to America through the Moody publishers. And so the gospel was being poured out into all the world and all people.
people were now available to, to, to be able to read the gospel, except for the, child, except for the Catholics. They were still not allowed to read the gospel until 1965. But to the rest of the world, it was made available to them. Now, the next one I want to talk about is William Booth, who lived in 1829 till 1912. He was, uh, he was born in Nottingham, England. He did not grow up in a Christian home, but he got saved as a teenager. And then he went on to preach as a Methodist. In 1865, he started his own movement because he felt that the message had to move from the pulpit into the streets. And his ministry was to street people and to those that were poverty stricken and to those that were poor. And the people were offended when the poor came into the churches that at that point of time was focused quite a bit on being proper and affluent and the, the high society English people. And he just decided, well, if they're not going to accept the poor, then he had to go to where the poor were. And he's, he's um, excuse me. His pulpit moved into the streets. I forgot to mention one thing about, about Charles and um, John uh, Wesley. They said that the world is our parish. And for them, there was no one place. It was the world. And so we see with William Booth, he said, well, if you're not going to accept the people being added to the church, then I'm taking the church into the streets. And therefore, he felt he couldn't carry on under the teaching of the Methodist movement. So what he did was, he started a new movement that was called the Christian Mission, and later on it was called the Salvation Army. The army in, in 1878, he started the Salvation Army. In 1865, he started the Christian Movement, but changed the name in 1878. By 1912, the army had worked in 58 countries. They reached the homeless and the poor, and wherever they went, they reached the lost. And they moved as an army of God to be able to work in. And they started the Salvation Army um, um, uh, uh, feeding schemes and all the ways that they possibly could to be able to reach the poor and the homeless and to bring the salvation message to the, everybody, to the whosoever was what an amazing work done by an amazing man who did not grow up in a Christian home, but got radically saved as a teenager. Amazing. So his work was mostly done in England, but it traveled to 58 countries because of what he had established. The next one I want to talk about is Amy Wilson Carmichael in 1867 to 1951. Now, what was amazing about this young woman is that she was born, I think she was born in Ireland, and she was one of seven children and the only one with brown eyes, and she regularly used to pray Jesus please will you make my eyes blue because she felt so out in a family of blue-eyed people that hers were brown but god laid upon her heart india and she became a missionary out of the protestant christian movement into india and when she got to india she realized that one of the greatest things that was a favor in her ministry was the fact that she had brown eyes and many times she would cover herself with coffee to darken her skin so that she she also dressed like an indian so that she could travel among them look like them and because she had brown eyes they completely accepted her and they didn't feel that she was an, an, an outsider coming in among them she did an amazing work among the young women specifically she wrote many, many books about her mission work, and she worked in India for 55 years. Um, she went first went to Japan, and then she went to Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka today, but then finally landed in India, and this was where she felt that she had her work to do. She worked among the women and the girls, and she saved many of them from forced, uh, forced prostitution. De Debbie... Uh, Diva Darcy is a term that was used for selling young women to be married to the temple or to the deity um, before the age of puberty. And the parents used to sell their daughters, consider it an honor, to sell them into the Hindu temples. She felt strongly against this. And her work, she worked strongly against this and she saved many of these young girls out of this lifestyle and um, eventually was able to educate them and bring them out of that and give them normal lives and give them good lives. She, her greatest quality was love. They all called her mom and her ministry was simple. 
<coughs> Excuse me. She just basically loved people, cared about them, and wanted to give them quality of life. Somebody wrote to her and said, what does it take to be a missionary? And her reply back was, missionary life is just a simple chance to die. She was an amazing woman that gave her life and her destiny to India. In 1912, Queen Mary recognized her work and funded, the, she, started a, she started a home for a thousand children, mostly girls, and they called it the, the Don Aver Fellowship in 1901. And it, it homed a thousand children. In 1912, Queen Mary recognized her work and funded a hospital. In 1918, they added a home for young boys, which were mostly the children of the, the, the prostitutes. In 1916, she started her own Protestant religion and called it the Sisters of the Common Life. And in 1932, she was injured badly in a fall. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. That basically left her um, bedridden for two decades. But this didn't stop her at all. She published 16 books from being in a place of being bedridden. And she revised all the other things that she had written. And she continued her work in the homes and in the hospital and in the ministry that she had started. She died at the age of 83 in India. She asked them not to give her a gravestone, so instead they put a bird bath on her grave with a little writing called Amma, which is the Tamil word for mama or mother that they wrote on there. And so there's, the bird bath was the only memory of who she was, but she was greatly loved, greatly respected, and she gave value to a people that had been completely cast aside and devalued um, and sold as prostitutes by their parents in India. Her life inspired the life of Jim and Elizabeth Elliot, and Jim was a Plymouth brethren who actually lived in the next era, in the 1927 to 1956, but he was so inspired, and his wife was so inspired by her life, that they um, decided to go into the ministry because of Amy Carmichael. And Jim Elliott was the man that when they went out to go and work in Ecuador with the Orca Indians, the five of them were killed as they arrived in to go and work with these Orcas. But Jim's wife and children continued the work. And today, many, many, many of those Indians are saved. And the man that killed Jim repented to his wife, ended up being a man that was born again and working with them to be able to save the Orca Indians. An amazing story inspired by the life of an amazing woman. So now we're going to talk about the Plymouth Brethren because Jim Elliot was a Plymouth Brethren. Now out of the Anglican Church, the Puritans and the Plymouth Brethren broke free so that they could come back to something that was far more the truth of the word. And so the big thing about the Plymouth Brethren that made them different to the Anglican was that they believed the supreme authority of the word alone. They didn't believe in the prayer books or any of the other writings, just the word of God. And so they were conservative. They were started in Dublin in 1820. And one of the most um, important founders of the Plymouth Brethren was George Muller, who lived in 1805 to 1898, and he was an incredible evangelist. So George, with a few other people, evangelizing and reaching the lost, started what they called the Plymouth Brethren, a conservative group, but their whole foundation was the word and only the word and nothing else. And out of that, we see Jim Elliot <coughs> being raised up as, a, as a, an evangelist to the Orca Indians and his wife continuing the work. Amazing how these people's lives had just these other people who were, who were um, so changed in the journey, and they too just ended up pouring the word of God to all the nations. And then I want to talk about two that affect South Africa. <clears throat> and the first one is David Livingston in 1813 to 1873. He was a Scottish physician and a, minister, and a missionary. And he had a heart for Africa, and so he spread the gospel in Africa wherever he went as an evangelist and as a doctor working with the people. And when he met Henry Morton Stanley, the famous quote, Dr. Livingston, I presume, 
um, was quoted when they met up in Africa. I think they would meet somewhere near the Victoria Falls. He eventually died in Zambia from dysentery and malaria. But by the time he died, he had spread the gospel right throughout most of the, on his adventures right throughout Africa, he'd taken the gospel wherever he'd been. And he'd gone as a doctor reaching the people. An amazing man who brought the gospel to deepest, darkest Africa. <clears throat> and then we see Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray was born in Hrafrenet, South Africa. His father was Scottish and his mother was a um, French Huguenot. <coughs> Excuse me, God. It's hay fever. I'm battling a little bit tonight. And... <coughs> Andrew Murray was a teacher and a pastor, and he was a death. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> a Dutch Reformed spirit filled missionary. And he had a passion for God and a passion for the Holy Spirit. And he was teaching, and in those days, they used to have a congregation for the colored and black folk and a congregation for the white folk. And it was said that there was a young 15-year-old girl that was listening at the door while he was preaching at the, to the white church. And the Spirit of God came down and landed on her. And that's where, the, where the, um, the revival of the 1860s, the South African revival of the 1860s started. Ushered in by Andrew Murray, a Dutch Reformed minister. And the Dutch Reformed still held on to quite a bit of the Calvinistic teaching. Um, they still do hold on to Calvinism, but he ushered in the revival in South Africa of 1860 out of the French Huguenots. And remember, the French Huguenots were those that had to escape um, because of their faith from France. And so his mother was a strong woman of faith and his father was Scottish. And he started the South African revival. Now, um, those were just a few, and I'm sure there are many more that I could tell you about, but that's enough for you to get a taste of what was just so amazing about these people and about what Jesus did through their lives in the nations. Now, I want to look at the promise of God, of Jesus to this church. He says in Revelation 3, verse 9, B to 13, I have loved you. Wow. To hear the words, I have loved you from Jesus is just absolutely amazing. Since you've kept my command and endured patiently, <clears throat> I will also keep you. And I want you to listen to this. He says, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world to test those who live on earth. He said to them, I will keep you from the hour of trial. So we see that after the church, of, after the letter to the church of Philadelphia, there was another hour coming, another hour of trial. That is the seventh letter to the church of Laodicea. That is the era that we live in. He said, but I will keep you from that hour because you have been faithful and because I love you, I will keep you from that hour. He said, I am coming soon. So he said to them, I'm coming soon. That is why there was such an urgency in their hearts to get the gospel to the nations. That is why they gave their lives so that the people that had never heard the gospel would be able to hear the gospel and be able to meet Jesus and be able to receive the king that they loved so much. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of the heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. <clears throat> he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So the first thing he promised them is that they wouldn't go through the hour of trial. My friends, that tells us something, doesn't it? It tells us that there's a church that is going to go through the hour of trial. And we need to understand that, that he said, I'm coming soon, but you won't go through the hour of trial. Then he said to them that um, I will make you a pillar. He promised them that he would make them a pillar in his church. And I just want to read to you. 
from Revelation 21. <clears throat> verse 1 to 12 and it's quite a long passage of scripture but i want to read that to you because this is the promise to them then i saw the new heaven and the new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea i saw the holy city the new jerusalem coming down from heaven from god and he said to them um Never again will, will you leave. The, the, um, I will make you a pillar in, my, in the temple of God. Never again will you leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. Um, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down of, out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautiful, dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with man, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away tears from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. <coughs> Excuse me. He, was, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this. It's the same promise to them. If you overcome, this is what I'm giving you. <clears throat> And I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexual immoral, those who practice magic arts, sorcery, pharmacia, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake, the burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the of the seven sorry one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me come and i will show you the bride the wife of the lamb and he carried me away in the spirit to the mountain great and high and showed me the holy city jerusalem coming down out of the heaven of god it shone with the glory of god and its brilliance was like that of the very precious jewel like a jasper clear as crystal it had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates to the east, three to the north, three to the south, and three to the west. The walls of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So he talks to them, and he says to them, Never again will you leave the temple of God. Um, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven. And I will also write on him my new name. And you know, whenever a bride marries a groom, she takes on his new name. And he says, you will carry my new name. Isn't that absolutely amazing? You know, what's very incredible for me is that many, many years ago, and was in early 2000, um, God gave me a vision and I saw the portal of heaven open and I was standing on a hill and as this portal opened and I looked into this portal that opened, I saw a city coming and it was this incredibly beautiful gold city that shone orange and it was sparkling and, and beautiful. And as I was watching, it was coming closer and closer and closer and closer. And I said, God, what is this? What is this? And he said, my, my new Jerusalem is coming. It's coming. And he showed me the city of God coming. And the second coming was so close. And it was just around the corner. And this is what he promised them. And this is what's described in Psalm 21. And he goes on to say to them, 
to him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple. I've read that to you. To you. Um, and he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Uh, he also spoke about the crowns. Oh, yes. Um, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crowns. And I want to just read a few scriptures about the crowns that they will be having that no one will be able to take from them. And the first one is from uh, 2 Timothy. <clears throat> Two Timothy four verse seven and eight. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous Judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to also to all. Who have longed for his appearance and so he says to them i'm coming soon hold on to that that you have so that no one will take your crowns one of them is the crown of righteousness for the overcomer the next one that we talk about is in james and if you look in james 1 verse 12 i had all of these marked out and i've just managed to quietly remove all my marks before i read them to you okay james 1 verse 12 says this Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And so the second one, he says that there's a crown of righteousness, there's the crown of life, and in 1 Peter 5, it talks about the crown of glory. And I'd like to read that to you quickly. 1 Peter 5, <clears throat> verse 2 to 10. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, not eager to serve, but not lording it, not greedy for money, but, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. <coughs> And when the chief shepherd is, appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So he says to them, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. And then he says that I'm giving you, I'm giving you the name of the new Jerusalem and I'm giving you my new name. This was the era where God restored evangelism back to the church. The previous era... He'd restored the Bible, he'd restored some measure of worship, he'd restored some measure of the priesthood of all believers, he'd restored Bible study back, he'd restored baptism back. Then we see with the turn of the century into the Philadelphia era, he restored the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the love of the Father, and the fullness of a spirit of evangelism. <clears throat> And they were able to reach the world and go out there and to turn nations and pagan nations and barbaric nations back to the Father, to reach the Father and to love the Father. And what they did affected people right from that day. Many of us are still affected by what they did because their lives have spoken so loudly. And he said to them, I love you. I'm coming soon, and you will not go through the final hour. So friends, there is a final hour, and it's a final hour of persecution. And the next letter is written to the church of the final hour. God bless you so much. I really pray that you've been inspired by some of these amazing people. There are more. You're welcome to go and read them up. I just wanted to give you a taste of some of the ones that lives just made such a difference in the world and just knowing their commitment and what it cost them and how many of them lost their children in the process and lost their wives and husbands in the process and yet they would not give up they would not give up because of the love of god they persevered they did not give up they didn't get tired they didn't get weary they didn't get disillusioned they didn't get mad at god they didn't blame god when things went wrong they just knew it was part of the part of their journey and as, as Amy Carl Michael said, being a missionary is just an excuse to die. And they gave their lives and they loved the nation that God had given them 
to go and bring the gospel to. A great door of opportunity had opened and they walked through that and they established the kingdom of God on, on earth as it is in heaven. I pray you've been inspired by some of them and I want to encourage you to go and read up some of the God's generals and go and read up some of the lives of these amazing people and not only read them, tell your children about them because our children need to know what it costs for the gospel of God to be established so that we can have the freedom that we have today and that we can have the Bibles available to us that we've got today. Bless you abundantly. I'm telling you in advance, next week is going to be a lengthy teaching. Please prepare to have a two-hour teaching because the truth of the matter is there's much that we have to cover in the last week, the, the final letter to the church in Laodicea. And so enjoy the Philadelphia church. Jesus loved them. And he was so excited by what they did. And he's called them those that will receive his new name. God bless you abundantly. Any questions, remember, send it on WhatsApp, seven letters to the seven churches. And on Tuesday night next week will be the final teaching. Bless you guys so much. Sleep well. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye.